Hello. Today I'll be reading about an especially fascinating topic in the world of Middle Earth. The Kingdom of Arnor. Arnor had already fallen by the time the Lord of the Rings trilogy starts, but its importance cannot be understated. I'll be reading from TolkienGateway.net. Arnor, or the Northern Kingdom, was a kingdom of the Dunatine in the land of Eriador in Middle-earth. It was the original seat of the High King of Arnor, who ruled over both Arnor and Gondor. Its geography included most of Eriador, between the Lune, west of which was Linden, and the rivers Greyflood and Loudwater, east of which was Rivendell. The Dunedain, or Honor, dwelt in many places in Eriador and specifically the courses of the rivers Lune and Baranduin, as well as Fornost. The capital was Anuminas. By the later Third Age, there were, bur- there were barrows and ruins at Kardalan and Rudar, Palantiri, or Seeing Stones, are relevant. They were spherical stones that could communicate with each other and give visual impressions to a skilled remote user. These stones were divided originally between Elendil and his two sons. They were usually heavily guarded and under the control of the kings. There were seven of these stones in total, with three of them assigned to the Northern Kingdom, with the other four going to Gondor. The Amonsol stone is noteworthy, as it was kept in the Watchtower of Amonsol, later known as Weathertop. Early history, before the foundation of Arnor, Eredor was home to middle men of a dying stock. A sizable Numenorean population was formed, a result of the slow emigration that started under Tar Meneldir and Tar Aldarion. The early colonists soon interbred with the indigenous population of Eriador, favored over the more southern regions, Gondor, because of the elves of Linden under Gilgalad, lived near it across the river Loon. Conversely, the king's men settled to the south in the later days. This led to a situation where Elendil arrived in an area populated by people who were mainly still faithful and elf friends, and unlike Gondor to the south, in Arn Arnor, much knowledge of the elder days was preserved. Elendil and his people reached Eriador, sailing into the Gulf of Loon. They were aided by the High King of the Noldor, Gilgalad, and his people and his ships sailed up the Loon River. Gilgalad even built the Emin Beride for Elendil. Elendil established the city of Anumas, Anuminas as his capital. Arnor was founded at the end of the Second Age, Second Age 3320, 
by Elendil, whose sons founded Gondor. At the same time, the history of the two kingdoms is intertwined. Both kingdoms are known as the realm of the Dunedine in exile. War of the Last Alliance At the end of the Second Age, Honor itself, allied with Noldorian High King Gilgalad in a great alliance opposing Sauron, the last alliance of elves and men, in conjunction with the southern forces from Gondor, they confronted Sauron's armies in the War of the Last Alliance. This was fought over a period of several years on the Daggerlad Plain and in Mordor itself, at the Siege of Beridor. Both Elendil and his son, Anarion, were slain in this conflict, but Isildur cut the One Ring from Sauron's finger and prevailed. Elrond, Gilgalad's herald, urged Isildur to cast it into Mount Doom and destroy it. But Isildur refused, and the ring survived. Arnor suffered heavy casualties in the war, and some parts of the land were partially depopulated. Arnor's second king was Isildur, who was also king of Gondor. He was killed in year two of the Third Age by orcs in the disastrous disaster of the Gladden Fields. His three eldest sons were killed with him, but the fourth and youngest, Valandiel, who had remained in, at Rivendell due to his youth, became king of Arnor. Isildur also lost the One Ring at this time, when it slipped off his fingers as he tried to escape pursuing orcs. Arnor was never fully recovered from the devastating loss of manpower he'd suffered in the war against Sauron. Because Valandil and his heirs did not claim the throne of Gondor, the realms were split but Arnor's ruler kept the title High King, whereas the South ruler was just King. Decline and breakup. Arnor's capital was Anominus on Lake Evendim, but by 861 of the Third Age, Fornost Erain had taken its place. No longer a site of such importance, Anuminas became depopulated and was slowly abandoned. After the death of its tenth king, Erendor, in Third Age 861, Arnor was shaken by civil war between his three sons, the eldest Amleth, claimed kingship over all Arnor, but was reduced to only ruling the region of Arthedain as his kingdom, while the other sons founded the breakaway kingdoms of Cardalon and Rutar. Arnor was refounded to Shur by Arthedain's king Argaleb I, when Cartelon placed itself under the uh, sesentry of Arthelain. However, even Arthelain was eventually destroyed. The people of Arnor were mostly wiped out by the continuing wars, but the hobbits survived in the Shire. Men survived in Bree and probably other villages. And the Dunedain of Arnor created new homes in the angle south of Rivendell, where some of them became known as Rangers of the North. 
conflict with Angmar, Arnor's greatest enemy in the north by the middle of the Third Age was Angmar, ruled by the Witch King of Angmar. During the reign of Malvagil, King 
attacked during the harsh winter weather, the capital of Fornost fell, and the remaining Arnorian forces were driven over the Luna River into Linden. King Arvidal was compelled to flee Forchel and ask aid of snowmen there. His son Arnoth journeyed to Curdan at the Havens to inform him of Arthedine's fall. Curdan responded by sending a ship north to rescue Arvidel. When the snowmen of Forchel saw the ship arrive, they were uncomfortable and nervous about the escape plan. Their chief replied to Arvidel, Do not mount on this sea monster. If they have them, let the seamen bring us food and other things that we need, and you may stay here till the witch king goes home. For in the summer his power wanes, but now his breath is deadly, and his cold arm is long. It turned out that the snowmen were right. A storm blew in that night and drove the ice toward the shore, and the ship was crushed and sank, with great loss of life, including King Arvidel. He unfortunately fulfilled Malbeth the Seer's prophecy about him at his birth, that he would be the last king of Arthedain. So the North Kingdom ended, but the hobbits survived in the Shire. They eventually chose a thane from among themselves to replace the king, and the first of these was Boca of the Marish. Showdown with Angmar. Envoys from Arthedain had journeyed to Gondor to ask assistance from the southern Dunedain in fighting the Witch King's forces. Gondor, however, was preoccupied with its own threats from Easterlings, and so could not respond immediately. Gondor had been in a weakened state since the death of King Andoer and his two sons in the Battle of the Camp fightings, fighting the Easterlings in 1944 of the Third Age. Arvadul of Arnor tried to claim the Southern Throne, but this claim was rejected by Gondor. Ernil, the victorious commander in the above battle and a member of the royal house, claimed the throne and was confirmed by the Gondorian royal council. King Arvidul sent increasingly urgent messages to Gondor about the crisis he faced from Angmar's continuing assaults. Ernil II was unable to react quickly due to his need to order Gondor after succeeding to the throne. However, the king sent his son and heir, Erner, north to the havens with a powerful fleet. Unfortunately, it was not in time to save Arthedain and the northern kingdom perished. When Aenir and his naval forces landed in the Grey Havens, they dazzled both men and elves with the size, the, um, their size and majesty. From these ships debarked the most powerful army seen in the north of Middle Earth in centuries. Girdan's people were quite impressed with the strength of Gondor's army, particularly its cavalry forces dominated by riders from the Vales of Anduin. Círdan and Aenir combined their forces along with the remnant of Arnor's army in the great joint elf-man army, the greatest since the War of the Last Alliance. This great host of the West recrossed the river Lune and marched northward. These allies drove relentlessly 
toward the Arnorian capital of Fornost, where the Witch King had occupied the palace complex there. When the Witch King saw the invading host, he failed to take it for the serious threat that it was. Instead of awaiting the invaders in the fortress city of Fornost, he confidently marched his forces out to meet them in the open. He expected to defeat them as easily as Arvidal's forces the previous year, but there was an appreciable difference this time. The ground and naval might of Gondor. The allied host continued to advance, and instead of establishing a merely defensive position, they attacked him from the hills of Evendim, and a large battle broke out. The Witch King's army could not stand before the Allies, however, and began to retreat back toward the capital. Any hopes for an orderly withdrawal were in vain, however. Gondorian cavalry forces attacked from the north, routed the forces of Angmar, and put them to flight, signaling an end to what became known as the Battle of Fornost. The Witch King, in full flight, forsook his new conquest and made for Angmar. But the cavalry under Aener continued the pursuit and rode down what remained of his forces. To add to his difficulties, an elephant force under Glorfindel also attacked from Rivendell and completed his forces' destruction. At the last, the Witch King charged Aener in frustration, but his horse shied away from the evil wrath. As Aener once again mastered his horse, Glorfindel uttered his famous prophecy, Do not pursue him. He will not return to this land for off yet is his doom, and not by the hand of man will he fall. The prophecy would not be fulfilled until a thousand years later at the Battle of the Pelennor Fields. Chieftains of the Dunedain, after the king, after the death of King Arvindel, I apologize with the font I'm reading. It's King Arvadui. Most of my pronunciation may be incorrect. His son, Aranoth. Aranoth perceived that the northern Dunedain had become too few to reestablish the realm of Arthodine. He took his dwindling people and turned them into wanderers who traveled from place to place in Eriador. Instead of calling himself a king or prince, he assumed the title chieftain. Through them, the royal line of honor was maintained successfully for a thousand years until the refounding of honor in the first year of the Fourth Age. Ar Arnoth brought his son Arhael to Rivendell and gave him to Elrond for safekeeping until he was grown. This became a tradition that was followed through the rest of the Third Age. Also brought to Elrond were the heirlooms of the house of Elendil, the scepter of Anuminus, the ring of Barahir, the shards of Narsal, and the star of Elendil. So the Dunedain survived in the shadows, waiting for a better day when the kingdom of Arnor would be reborn. There were sixteen chieftains in direct descent, with Aragorn, Elisar, being the last. There were many perils in Eriador at this time, and many of the chieftains died premature deaths. One of these was Aragorn's father, Arathorn II, who was slain by orcs raiding the area.
The kingdom of Arnor had been fallen for a thousand years by the time the War of the Ring broke out, but northern forces did not um, refuse to participate. They were involved. Aragorn II was a Dunedain ranger of the north, and there were several hundred of them operating during the conflict. A company of this group, a company um, accompanied by Aragorn through the paths of the dead and during the attack on Umbar which captured the Corsair fleet they participated at the last battle fighting under his banner at the, ba at the battle of the Moranon where Sauron was finally thrown down there was conflict in other areas in the north, there were three different invasions of Lothlorien, which were thrown back by the elven army under Celeborn and Thranduil. Finally, Celeborn led an attack, resulting in the capture of Dol Goldor, and put an end to Sauron's northern threat. There was also a battle fought in the Shire between Sauron's ruffians and the Hobbit militia forces. This was the last battle fought in the War of the Ring and resulted in the death of Saruman and the death or capture of his followers. This became known as the Battle of Bywater and represents the Hobbit contribution to the war. Faramir, son of Denethor II, the last ruling steward, presented his rod of office to the new king and received it back from him. Aragorn II, then crowned by Gandalf as King Elisar, refounded the kingdom of Arnor as part of the reunited kingdom and made Anuminus his new capital city. He was wed to the elven princess Arwen, who became Queen Evanstar of Arnor and Gondor. After the fall of Sauron, Arnor was safe again for resettlement of men and although it remained less populated than Gondor to the south, in time, Arnor became a more densely populated region again, even if it had dwindled in size due to the independence of the Shire. The area encompassed by the reunited kingdom now encompassed the territory of the two kingdoms at their greatest extent. In the north, this included all the lands between the River Lune and the Misty Mountains, and in the south included all the lands between Dunland in the west to the far Harad southward to Rune in the east. The reborn kingdom continued on into the Fourth Age, and with Eldarion eventually succeeding his father to the throne of this now empire-sized state, Many people in Arnor were Numenorean stock. However, aside from these exiles, most had long since mingled with non-Numenorean people. The predominant language spoken by them was Westron. At least some of the population, especially the upper classes, were fluent in Sindarin. While Quenya was studied as a language of lore. Many early place names and names of the royal house were Quenya, but by the 8th century of the Third Age, Quenya had given way to Sindarin. Honor was the colloquial name for the North Kingdom. The Northern Kingdom, as the land was called at its conception, was also known 
as Termen Volandieva in Quenya and Arthur No for Lenos in Sindarin. These names quickly fell out of use in favor of Arnor, the land of the king, so called for the kingship of Elendil and its seal, and to seal its precedence over the southern realm. Portrayal and adaptations. Peter Jackson's movies do not mention the long history of how Arnor and Gondor diverged, nor do they mention Arnor by name. The one passing reference to it is in a scene from the extended edition when Aragorn reveals to Eowyn that he is actually 87 years old. She realizes that he must be one of the Dunedain, a descendant of Numenor blessed with long life, but says that she thought his race passed into legend. Aragorn acknowledges that he is one of the Dunedain, and explains that there are not many of his people left because the northern kingdom was destroyed long ago. That's the end of this article. Thank you so much for bearing with me as I try to read this font the way I've presented it, and I try to pronounce the words though I've said them incorrectly. But I do find this subject incredibly fascinating, because Arnor is not talked about all that much, but as part of the Dunedain kingdoms, the kingdoms that descend from Numenor. It's incredibly important, and since the line of kings that can be tracked back to the ruling king of both Gondor and Arnor, which is Aragorn, traces his ancestry actually through Arnor rather than directly through Gondor. That's part of the reason why the true king of Gondor is up in the north that has to do with all this history of Arnor and his role as a Dunedain. It's also a bit confusing to me in some ways that I don't fully yet understand regarding the racial identity of the Dunedain, because Dun means West and Dain means men, but specifically the good and faithful men who fought alongside with elves and the Valar against Morgoth. But Dunedain specifically therefore means men of Numenor who decided to go to Numenor, or descend from Numenor, or came from Numenor later, and founded Gondor and Arnor, once returning to Middle-earth. The men of Numenor, the Dunedain, were blessed with long life, and great stature and strength, but they weren't given immortality like elves. However, it's interesting because it's not just a few men who were Dunedain in the north or in the south. These entire kingdoms were founded by Dunedain. And the reason why people don't live to be 400 years anymore in these kingdoms is the idea that, as I understand it, these bloodlines were essentially watered down by intermingling with native Middle-earth humans, men, who never went to Numenor, or were never born in Numenor, or never descended from Numenor, basically regular humans, and therefore it was watered down. But the idea, therefore, is that most Gondorian people, or people of Arnor, descent, even if they still live just about as long as regular humans, chances are they have some Numenorian in them, like it's fairly evenly watered down because it's been centuries and centuries. However, in the case of Aragorn, they talk about it as though it's been somewhat segregated out, as though it's remained pure, 
which is to imply then that these chieftains or this line of father to son kings who became chieftains of the Dunedain in the north were only marrying women who in turn were also either fully blooded Numenorian by descent or close to fully blooded Numenorian by descent and therefore less quote unquote watered down if you will but this is my speculation based off the fact that Aragorn lives to be much longer than other Gondorians or even other men in the north who seem to descend from the kingdom of Arnor and not just from local tribes or say Dunlendings or wild men or um, the Rohanian type people who were a dine but a dine who did not choose to gain the Numenorean powers or go to Numenor and gain long life so I am a bit curious about how it was preserved with Aragorn because even if you preserved the line if that line is still intermingling, it would still be just as watered down. So I wonder if there was some, not incest, but a kind of only desire to breed with purely Numenorean descent because you could absolutely be a descendant of Isildur but still most of your blood be non-Numenorean just by way of intermixing with local Middle-earth native human blood the way it sounds like it had been for most people. I think you get what I mean now. But it's just something that I think about every now and then. So this video is far from perfect. Any feedback or tips on what works best for you? I purely whispered in this video, but let me know if you think I should have the gain up or if you'd like more softly spoken or if you would like to see role playing in the world of Lord of the Rings or any other world or if you prefer me reading these histories. I'm curious about what you like and what you're interested in. So feel free to let me know. I'm Michael Eldridge again. This is the Eldridge Voice channel ASMR. Attempt at it anyway. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate you checking out these videos, at least a little bit. If you want to, feel free to like and subscribe. And I need all the feedback I can get. I'll see you next time. Stay relaxed, my friends.